Welcome everybody to this uh, session that um, the second session of uh, Dido's little mini series on the art of collage. Uh, those of you who um, were here last time will know how illuminating the session last uh, three weeks ago was and uh, Dido just um, gave us a lot of, well for me a lot of new insights into, into the art of collage lot of really interesting information and some fantastic images and she's going to follow that up this time we're going a little bit deeper into the uh, disruptive and subversive aspects of collage. Uh, it, if you haven't if you didn't see the first session it, I, it's not necessary to enjoy this one um, but I will be putting both sessions up um, on the Arts and Society Forum website in uh, uh, so not website, uh, the Academy of Ideas website, Arts and Society Forum page uh, in due course sooner uh, uh, in, over the next few days. Um, just uh, before I introduce uh, Dido properly, uh, I just want to say something about the Academy of Ideas, uh, which the Arts and Society Forum is part of. We, um, the Academy of Ideas has not been um, uh, has not been furloughed, has continued to work throughout this period and will continue to work however long this is going to go on for. Uh, and uh, so, but doesn't have its sort of um, normal sources of funding through selling tickets and that sort of thing. It's been putting on lots of events and they're all free except for um, one or two like this one. And so if you have any spare cash lying around in the lead up to Christmas, um, do uh, donate a, a Christmas present to them because it will be very much appreciated and it will help with the work going on into the next year. Um, and uh, the, the range of sessions, uh, the range of events really is quite enormous and is very, um, um, uh, you know, well, I've, I've certainly found them very um, useful ways of keeping one's brain cells alive and one's critical fact faculties going over the over this very difficult period. So, as I say, I think uh, Academy of Ideas does a great job and um, it's really worth giving some of them a bit of support. And I think uh, Mo might put up a link on the chat in uh, if, if uh, you want to check that out so you can make a donation. Um, so uh, the Zoom, how the Zoom works, just um, to make sure that you all, uh, if you haven't, uh, aren't very familiar with all the Zoom, and I find I'm learning all the time the different things that it can do. But um, Dida will uh, share her screen in a minute. And um, while the, she, she's doing a shared screen, uh, you can um, see, you can reduce your little, thumbnail screens of everybody else, other people in the, in the, um, uh, in the room by, um, if you see at the top of the column, there's a sort of like a, a number of little bars and the, the single bar um, minimizes it completely. So you can see the images without, um, uh, without any kind of a, or with almost no obstruction. If you want to see a uh, Dido, you do the middle bar, which is slightly thicker. And then if you want to see other people in the room, you can um, do the double bar that's on the furthest right of the three. So that's what you can do while you're uh, listening. And you can also move that little group of images around if you prefer, if you want to do that. Um, when we come to, uh, that, that Dada will speak, be speaking for um, about 45 minutes or a bit longer, and then there'll be time for questions and answers. Uh, the, best thing is if you can put up your hand, which you can do um, by clicking on participants. And when the list of participants comes up, you'll have a, you have a raised hand at the bottom. So you can use that, um, click on that if you want to ask a question or say anything indeed, you, don't, it can, you can make a comment. If you um, don't want to do that, uh, but do have a question, then, um, or if you want to ask questions in the course of the talk, you can use the chat facility, which is also um, along the bottom of your screen and will remain there. Um, okay, so I think um, we are ready to uh, get Dido started. Dido, um, the, 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 just a bit of background on these tours. Dido 
has been giving lectures in London galleries uh, for the last uh, three or four years, two or three years, lose track. And um, they've been fantastic for people who who live in London. Uh, really great ways of us spending a Sunday morning and and getting to know an art gallery, the works an art gallery in much more detail. Um, but obviously we couldn't do that this year. Uh, so um, Dido devised this little way of um, giving us as her lecture on screen. And this is the second of the two, and we're hoping to be able to do uh, more next year. Dido is an artist herself a, and a, an art history teacher. And I think that that combination just means that she's really um, gives insights uh, into works of art as art, as opposed to um, their um, necessarily just their historical content or their um, meaning or whatever. She, she just helps uh, us look at art much more closely. So I've always found her sessions really enjoyable and illuminating and I know a lot of other people have. So um, without further ado, I'm going to um, highlight uh, speaker view, highlight spotlight video, that's right. And Dido, it's over to you. You can share your screen now, I think. Um. <clears throat> okay, uh, so I'm following on from the collage talk that I gave a few weeks ago. And in that talk, I was dealing with um, more romantic and sentimental ways in which collage, the tearing up and sticking down and gluing of um, extraneous materials to a canvas uh, had been used. This time I'm looking at um, different ways in which collage has been used to uh, subvert uh, normality, suggest uh, political or environmental ideas, um, challenge the art establishment, challenge uh, the bourgeoisie, um, and engage in modernity particularly. So uh, we're looking at how artists wanted to um, celebrate modern technology and wanted, and in the case of some artists with collage, they actually wanted to almost compete with the technological advances that were going on around them. I'm starting in the present with a, uh, a photo montage that is in the Royal Academy Summer Stroke Winter Exhibition right now. So I'm starting in the present and then I'm going to trace um, through the influences backwards and then we will be going forwards again later on covering different themes. And one of the things that is very possible with photo montage is um, the use of many references to past styles. So I'm going to show how some contemporary artists are very keen on uh, citing uh, influences from the past. The photo montage is particularly interesting at the moment because of advances in digital technology. Um, also in contemporary art, there's a great emphasis on photography, particularly now with advances in digital um, photography, you can produce enormous photographs that almost convey a sense of awe that was present in large uh, salon paintings of the 19th century. Um, and from, from this, then we're going to see, well, how did artists start doing this originally? So uh, this photo montage by Emily Oldchurch, Ghost Towers, uh, presents a fantastical scene, as you see, with um, antique, antique um, monuments, urns, uh, vessels, graves, statues, and in combination with modern, modern buildings. So I'll tell you the, the sources and what it's about, and then the procedure, how uh, she actually makes these um, photo montages, the photo montage being um, photographs that have been uh, sliced and reassembled to create a new, a new reality. 
So this is it, this is a work that is a sort of dialogue piece to um, respond to Piranesi's fantastical views of Rome. And I'll be darting between the two. So um, uh, Emily Ashchurch is responding directly to this particular um, e engraving that uh, Piranesi did. She, it's based on um, the Glasgow Necropolis, which is a Victorian cemetery with 3,500 monuments. And um, it, it was um, it, it was a, a new a new burial ground that opened in Glasgow, one of the first ones where you could actually pay for a burial place. And this was the same as in uh, Pierre Lachaise Cemetery in Paris, where, where our church has also worked. She's finding and responding to things within this cemetery that remind her and connect with what she's seen in Piranesi's, Piranesi's uh, fantasy views of uh, Rome, where you have extreme contrasts of um, uh, sort of grand and minuscule. Um, the composition, it's sort of sliced in two with a diagonal going right through. So she's taken a very low view looking up so that this will exaggerate the size of the monuments and uh, you can also see there's a sort of a dark arrangement in the foreground and light in the background but it's also dark on one side and light on the other side with the path dividing so it's very much a, a division of two uh, sorts of world worlds um, and everything, if you follow along the path, you lead finally to this bizarre um, uh, pyramid at the end. And there are little details like this, this, this sculpture sitting on the fluted column here. As you come down, suddenly the shock of seeing, well, you're looking at a telephone box kiosk. And then you've got the urns and the lands. And then over here, um, a sort of romantic poet as if he's and you know, in the last gasps of life, climbing into a coffin. Then you've got Hercules, and you've got dead. You've got shrubbery. You've got um, ivy connected to death, especially in Victorian times. And these flopping weeds, these plants that are sort of not attended to. So, in a way, what you have is a sort of a crumbling empire, and the crumbling empire faces the modern new empire, which is in the process of being built, but is also empty. You see all the windows are empty. So the ghost towers is connecting to Piranesi, but actually referring to uh, con the building of um, enormous fancy apartments for overseas buyers that are left empty. So we have the double ghosts. We have the sort of notion of ghosts reflected in the funerary theme and then the ghosts in the uninhabited modern buildings. And the division of dark and light. So death and culture on one side and growth and um, lack of habitation on the other. And then in the middle, between, between these two sides are little tents. And I will talk about those in more detail later on. But in the middle, between the, the, the two forms of, of emptiness, the memento moris here, you have the homeless. So the themes that are explored are ruin lust and architectural hubris, which she thinks is represented by the, the large developments, um, and uh, references to the grand tour in the 18th century. And as you can see, she's referenced um, uh, Piranesi very, very closely. Piranesi's drawings are, um, his, his engravings are incredibly fantastical, but all based on aspects of Roman and Greek architecture. The diagonal is, in Piranesi's time, this was unusual. So you have the diagonal, again, looking at the architecture and the monuments from beneath 
and you have the division of light and dark, a standard procedure for 18th century paintings to have dark in the foreground to gradually lead you to um, a light background, as in, for instance, a Claude painting in little details. This is a fantastic view, a fantastic view of Rome. You've got sort of maybe a, a Romulus figure feeding from a wolf, uh, statues that have been um, damaged, many damaged statues. Um, and Piranesi trained as an architect, uh, but um, mainly did all these amazing prints for uh, the burgeoning group of uh, people from northern countries coming to Italy to do the grand tour. And of course, many people arrived in Italy and were terribly disappointed to find that um, Rome was not as dramatic as they imagined it would be. <laughs> He goes against the nature of Greek classical buildings because the uh, symmetry that is present in uh, buildings based on uh, um, pillar and post is, uh, is eliminated by taking this diagonal view. And Piranesi, uh, in the 18th century, there was an argument going on between uh, whether Greek classicism was better than Roman and Piranesi was a great fan of Roman and this I think connects very closely to Ashchurch's interest. He favoured Roman art because of its connection to technology. He liked the enormity of the buildings, the awe-inspiring aspect and he also liked the fact that their works were influenced by Etruscan, Egyptian and Greek. And he believed that by um, borrowing forms that were exotic from exotic and bizarre sources, this would prove a route to creativity. And in the case of Ashchurch, this is also very strong. Her, her method, her method of working was she would go to an area, take hundreds of photographs, then actually slice and put together again hundreds, but this would all be done digitally. And then um, she would um, copy and paste the photos through Photoshop and blend them in by using, by altering the colors into a whole that would be cohesive. So she would digitally, digitally adjust and the shadows in um, her work, which also create um, the atmosphere of the work, uh, these are digitally manipulated and added. And the final, then her aim, and I think what she does convey in this is a, a compressed journey, a journey that's been compressed into a single image which fuses history with modernity. Um, and behind that, she's also very interested in um, the, uh, the, the message about housing, the social message to do with that. Uh, I zoomed in in detail in this one because here you can see the tense, um, you know, her, her reference to the problem of homelessness in amongst this grandeur. And she's not alone in treating the theme of tents and sleeping bags in contemporary art. This is a piece by Gavin Turk, and uh, it's made out of bronze. So that's really what's extraordinary about it. A man in a sleeping bag made of bronze. So you've got the irony of the uh, fact that this should be a temporary measure, being homeless, sleeping in a sleeping bag, but bronze is enduring. So the suggestion that this could be an enduring, lasting state, but actually, the artist is very much concerned with sort of navel gazing and wondering about the myth of the artist and the authorship of a work. Um, so in a way, he's more interested in examining the skewed art system, but I felt that it did relate to Emily's work. The technique of um, slicing images from different sources and trying to make them blend together so that you've created a convincing, um, believable whole out of juxtapositions that are 
completely incongruous and quite um, uh, threatening in their incongruity. This is what Max Ernst explored in his uh, photo in his um, sorry in his um, collages, his collage novels. And in a way, this goes against what we saw in the other collages that we looked at last week, where they were made up of opposing elements and the different elements in the collage jut into each other, almost vying for position. This, um, he did a series of books and this, uh, Semen de Bonte, um, was a book that he got done in three weeks. And what he was using, were his sources were um, Victorian pulp fiction, uh, Victorian anthropomorphic books on, on uh, medicine, books on uh, um, botany, a uh, whole variety of, of things. Um, and he, in this particular case, is also looking at Victorian steel engravings. He would also look at woodcuts um, and adverts. And he said the now pictures of advertising became so many dramas, revel re revelatory of my most secret desires. So this peculiar picture, its peculiarity particularly comes through uh, the ordinariness of the uh, style of engraving that of course it is seeped with Victorian connotations, a train carriage with a respectable looking man sitting with a face that's half, half bird, half lion. And then above him, uh, you see the sort of the um, veins of, of leaves and then this threatening sphinx that's being devoured and chewed at and mauled by extraordinary dogs on enormously long legs. And then the legs of a woman at the bottom. So this might, you know, there are bits of this um, uh, image that would have been chosen, taken from a, a sort of a little um, popular crime novel and then uh, put together. Now he would uh, use um, razor blades and slice the images very, very carefully, again with the idea of creating a new entity that would be um, seamless. And this particular story uh, was seven days to represent seven elements, blood, water, mud, each up named after a day of the week. And the themes running through them were violence, sex, and one of um, Max Ernst's favorite themes, anti-clerical uh, sentiments. Um, he would zoom in on detail of the original, um, the original engraving, and then he, he would add uh, a small elements uh, at, at the late stage. So um, this particular man fits into the mud, the mud category uh, in that the lan is associated with mud in, in this work. He looked at Gustave Dory's engravings and he was very influenced by yeah, Victorian encyclopedias, pulp fiction, and Jules Marais' book, um, The Damned of Paris. So it is quite a threatening, looming image, particularly because of the vastness of the Sphinx looking through the window and a, a feature that recurs in many of Ernst's works, the bowler hat. So you've got the absolute uh, subversive contrast of the respectable bowler hat and the extraordinary creature um, uh, in the face. Another, another scene from this novel. Um, so again, sex, violence, the extraordinary positions. And um, bizarre heads that they're suggestive. He is not wanting a direct reading of symbol for symbol, but you can see he's very much exploited the, the, the grain and the, the, the mark making that, you, that is produced by 
the engravings and it's so persuasive because the style is such a sort of legible style. Um, photo montage connects very closely to film and um, the, it was particularly popular because um, it allowed a feeling of many spaces and a feeling of time and uh, a photo montage image would allow you to show an entire city in plentitude from many different angles so that it's almost like cramming in every aspect of a city and uh, emphasizing the directions. So simply by assembling the different views, you have a very increased sense of jerky movement within this, which captures, which gives a feeling of, of sound and movement, all the things that made cinema so popular. So, um, in the case of uh, um, Maholi Naj, uh, this is called The Merchant of, of Berlin. He did this as a backdrop to a play and Maholi Naj um, uh, was working at the Bauhaus, the most um, avant-garde uh, school of art and design at, at the time. And very much, he, his paintings were abstract and he very much wanted to bring industry into art. He didn't want the separation. He wanted art to um, almost follow some of the ways machines work in order to be a valid practice. So if you look at um, this city, you see there are many, many diagonals and verticals. I mean, it's very, it's very geometric and that links to some of his abstract works as well. So he's bringing industry and geometry together. And though you've got the chaos of the city, this is probably the opposite of El Church's um, image. This is a very dynamic city with an enormous feeling of speed and possibility and crowds and, and growth and action. With a, a amazing tilting. So the, the buildings in the background are very close to early images of um, Cubist painters like Delaunay, each from a different angle, maximizing your almost tactile uh, pleasure of the city. And with all the, um, the, the trains and the cars sort of coming towards you so that you feel a sense of um, cacophony. He called his works uh, photoplastic and um, he uh, said he wanted to um, convey concentrated situations. And he wanted to uh, engage with the very democratic aspect of photography that it allows the viewer to engage with a whole series of views and information that was previously, previously um, not accessible to, to them and particularly different focus, scope, perspectives, and uh, the patterns and the textures that you can find um, in, industrial, uh, uh, in an industrial city. And through doing, uh, through mixing it with uh, his constructivist elements, as a painter, he was part of a Russian constructivist, works based on the pure power of geometry a lot. Um, he also referenced the straight photographs that were being taken in the 1920s. So he really hoped for a utopian type of modern, uh, modern modernism that would reflect the machine age and celebrate it and industry and art would be integrated. And uh, I wanted to use this one because this is a, a sort of quite a standard, now has become a standard use of photo montage, the idea of uh, figures silhouetted against backgrounds. So here you have um, the boxers uh, being victorious over uh, the background 
that sinks into the background. And then, oh, sorry. And then um, in a completely different style, uh, the cutout of Hitler with a ridiculous newspaper hat on his head, a different visual language to the language of both the boxers and the city. Um, Blumenfeld was actually sort of the highest paid uh, fashion photographer at the time, but he was very keen on boxers and this, the boxer that he uh, has presented is um, Jack Johnson. Um, and he would do these photo montages as a private pursuit. Uh, uh, he, at the time that he was doing these, he was um, uh, running a failing handbag shop in Amsterdam and he would be doing these upstairs combining newspaper cutting scraps and a lot of his collages have quite the act of cutting underscores an element of violence in many of the scenes that he's he's presenting they're they're very trusting um and he said that he uh, saw himself as um a, he was born in berlin jewish and refers to himself as a berliner and wanted to associate with um the dada group in berlin uh and his anti-hitler stance has been interpreted as not being so ideological so much as just hitler represented uh a block to his freedom. So it's more the notion of Hitler as a threat to freedom. And his preference for Jack Johnson was he, uh, he was a fighter who spoke out against um, racial, who spoke for racial equality and was uh, greatly victimized by the white establishment. So he poses, he positions him as victorious over the Manhattan uh, sky, skyline uh, and many of his works uh, they use they use irony um, you know as well uh, this is a, a building this is a, Unfortunately, it's a model of the original building. So it's done 20, 23 to 33, and then it was bombed and destroyed during the war. And it's built in the artist's house in Hanover. I'll just show you, um, I'll just go forward and show you what collages he does. Um, uh, Kirchfit has invented um, a name for his type of collage. He called it Mertz. And the title is a very, he was associated with the Dada movement and it's a title that relates to uh, the sort of uh, celebration of nonsense and the anti-art uh, aspects of, of Dadaism. It's, he just chose it from um, uh, a, Mer uh, a name of a bank, Mertz Bank, and it's a fragment of that name. And, um, he just collected, he made art out of old railway tickets, uh, bus tickets, scraps, things friends had given him, rubbish. Very, very keen on assembling collages out of rubbish. And if you look at the, um, uh, the technique here, we see the tears. It's a totally different approach to uh, the seamless uh, cutting that we see with Max Sands. Here, uh, he is acknowledging the individual sort of objectness of each, each piece of paper, and they are crowding each other. Uh, there's no um, uh, delicate design of it all. It's, it's sort of life crammed into the work. So in my, back to the building, uh, oh, sorry. He called this Mertzbau, so it's a Mertz building. He started to collect rubbish and started to uh, create a sort of assemblage installation in his own house, um, building uh, with rubbish and card and bits of wood, bits of old shoes, anything that um, he could he, he'd pick up, and uh, bits of lino, bus tickets. And it was 
uh, it had a life of its own that sort of started to, to build from room to room. So uh, I included it because it's the three-dimensional transformation of the, uh, the act of collage. And in fact, in early cubism collage, um, uh, small cardboard sculptures were often used to try and work out problems, uh, spatial problems that uh, could then uh, be applied to paintings. So this was quite an extraordinary building and he, it responded very much to the time. Um, Schwitter said that uh, in Germany in 1918, for example, everything had broken down and new things had to be made out of fragments. And this is Metz. It was like a revolution within me, not as it was, but as it should have been. So the method of using the materials is seen as a fairly radical and revolutionary act in itself. And he referred to this central column as a cathedral of erotic misery. So I thought that one would sort of connect to the other buildings that we were looking at. Sorry, one second, please. Oh, I can't, I can't find it. Anyway, I'll, I'll talk about this. But, um, this is, uh, Max Sense, the entire city. And initially, you should look and think, it doesn't look much like a city except for the layering and the repetition of small, small um, apertures. Um, and reviewers who looked at this said, oh, it's, it's a modern city that is in a state of decay. So it still sort of got the, um, the feeling of something, something rotten, even the, the, the brownish coloring. Um, and Max Ernst used, invented ways of using paint that work in a very similar way in which collage could work. So uh, he used a um, technique called frottage and grattage. Um, and here he's, he's, put on the, he's put on the paint and then uh, sometimes it's then scratched away. And in this case, the, the bands that are going across, sometimes he would, he would um, press into the wet canvas uh, fish, fish bones, or at other times combs, and these have been repeated, repeated, building up a whole, uh, a whole feeling of um, a, a crammed building. So the actual textures, the textual um, manipulations and inventions that he created, totally carry the message, and there's really no need for narrative. Um, once he's done that. But they, this one, though it's called The City, it relates very closely to many of his landscapes. He was interested in Nietzsche's theory of dread. He was interested in um, Caspar David Friedrich's pantheistic landscapes, uh, in Wagnerian uh, ideas of the forest, uh, German fairy tales to do with evil in the forest so um and he believed that when you look at plants or um neglected objects very closely um you you can get ideas from them so one of the sort of key influential ideas that he um that he was working with um was as a child he remembered looking at the uh board of his bed and at uh, the wood and seeing shapes within it. He had read about Leonardo reading into clouds, reading into spots of ink and seeing shapes within it. So it's the, it's the idea of a feedback. You, you do an art activity where you can't anticipate the result. So anything to do with printing and pulling off something, sometimes he would put two sheets of paper together with paint on them, pull them apart 
and the shape that then was left would be the starting point for um, uh, a painting that he would uh, work into it for seeing images within it. And his frottage was rubbing, but instead of, you know, rubbing um, uh, uh, sort of drawings or um, anything, he, he would rub um, old bits of wood, uh, buttons, and then these things would turn into, so if you look at the bottom of this image, there's almost a bird-like creature. Well, the bird could be formed just from a, a, a dot or a hollow in the eye, and then a whole creature could form around it. But critics said that this is a sort of a modern utopia that is in the process of rot rotting, a, uh, a falling citadel. And so I thought that was interesting, the notion of the falling citadel here and the fact that, that the idea that Ashchurch was working with the, the falling Roman Empire. Um, oh, someone, sorry, but some of my, <laughs> oh no, here we are. Um, okay, I'm coming back back to um, the earliest collages, how the whole thing started. And uh, there were some collages that Picasso did that were very political. And usually when his collages are discussed, they're discussed in terms of uh, the use of newspaper, the use of the other papers, how things overlap, how the spaces buy together, and you get a push and pull of juxtapositions where you have paradoxical relationships. So uh, you stick one piece of paper on another, then you add some drawing. Um, is this piece of paper um, behind suddenly the bareness of uh, the crescent shape of a supposed glass here leaps forward more than the blue paper behind it because a dark shadow has been added. It's, pushing pushing and pulling uh, space that uh, creates a new attitude to space that was very much to do with uh, rejecting the singleness of um, single point perspective and uh, exploring the idea that we experience space in many different ways through tactile and visual senses. And if you want to depict an object you move all around it and give as many views as possible of that object. After all, you know the back exists, even if you can't see it. But in this collage, we have a central um, arrangement, possibly the round is the table, the Seuss refers to um, the drink, and we see these tops that are um, tops of bottles or parts of glasses. I mean, it's a decoding activity. But the, it's unusual in that you've got whole channels of text um, in big sections. And the texts have been examined and they, uh, they tell a story and Picasso has cut up the text to create a new uh, dialogue. So these, uh, these are from a newspaper on 18th of November, 1912, and they all refer to the Balkan war uh, to Turkey trying to defend the Ottoman Empire against um, the advances of Bulgaria, Serbia and Greece. So discussions were going on and what role would France be taking and, um, you know, would they be involved in this? And uh, there was, a, so part of the reports on the right hand side, uh, there is a report about a 40,000 uh, man, um, socialist gathering uh, that took place to protest against the war. And then on the left hand side, there were descriptions of the battle's movements, uh, you know, chasing, uh, following the actual battles, and also very, very gruesome descriptions of uh, the victims of the war. And some of these have been put upside down. So you, the, the fracturing of the newspapers themselves and the objects, it all uh, breaks up what is happening 
in the world, it, it suggests the fracturing of everything that's that's going on. Um, and Picasso was also he, he was uh, going with and against what newspapers made made possible. So he would take from all parts of the newspapers, including the financial pages, but by leaving a whole section advertising, um, you know, that relates to the protests. Uh, he was going up against the format of most of the newspapers where that would be buried amongst um, more trivial um, and commercial sensational information. So his reassemblage of the news in, its, in itself uh, acts as a sort of um, uh, an anarchic uh, act, which uh, has been interpreted as a sort of counter discourse. And this also goes with the anarchic act of what he is presenting as art and what he has decided to do with a still life. And the prominence of newspaper within these still lives where you have drink, table, glass, is in the, um, the uh, cafes that, that Picasso went to, newspapers were free. And it was particularly a mark that these were the proletariat cafes and everything in the painting, in the, in the work of art, in this collage, these are all perishable materials. So this is again a massive challenge to the concept of artworks um, taking their value from their ability to pass from generation to generation. It defies the art world to treat them as precious. The fact that they are made of materials that will eventually um, rot and yet actually the newspapers have survived in incredibly, incredibly well. Under Suze, under the word Suze, this would have originally been red and it's faded. So if you'd still had that red, you'd have the red, white and blue, you'd have the tricolor. And again, that would have two meanings once again. One, the repressive meaning of the government who was um, uh, taking them into war. And the other one, the original meaning of the revolution and Picasso enjoyed playing with all of those. So obviously he was asked if he actually uh, really did intend, um, you know, if he put the demonstration column in on purpose. And this is what he said, of course I did. Of course I did it on purpose. It was my way of showing I was against the war. Dido? Yes? You've had about 40 minutes. Okay, brilliant. I, I, I'll make it. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. okay. Uh, another, um, it's actually a painting, but this is in the spirit of collage. The spirit of collage is trompe l'oeil, um, trickery, uh, false, uh, deceiving, um, you know, hide and, hide and seek, detective work, clues, signs. So here, Picasso has actually painted a work as if it's acting like a collage. And what Picasso includes jokes in his work. So this relates to his role of an art, as an artist, but it also relates to um, the um, uh, new um, uh, aeronautic uh, uh, successes. So to, to the first flights of the Wright brothers, um, and in this particular case, it relates to, as well as that, um, the Michelin Tower Company wanted to uh, raise money for its um, aviation project. So it's touching on that, but by um, referencing the Wright brothers, Picasso's playing a little joke with his friend Brack, suggesting that their experiments and their uh, desire to create a new future, you know, are on a par of, with the Wright brothers. And particularly effective is the bit where Notre Avenir dans l'air, where you would get a whoosh of paint going across the tricolor and the, and the, um, the writing as if, it's, as if it is going really fast, as if you feel the air whooshing through. 
and the scallop shapes also are sort of visual pun on the idea of maybe balloon shapes. Um, uh, they are all expansive and the whole, even the oval shape is a buoyant, a buoyant shape um, that with suggestions of, you know, rolling along. And then the, wet, the words that are scattered to sort of create a feeling of noise, J-O-U, the word uh, short for journal, that itself has even been dissected in the same way that all objects have been dissected. And the line coming through the U with part of it uh, hiding behind makes it look as though this whole shape of the U could suddenly swivel round. Again, challenging all notions of static space. Even more extreme is um, the futurist Car Carlo Caro's interventionist demonstration poster. This is a really a good example of, of collage at its most powerful using words and treating words as if they are objects so that you create a sound by changing the shape of the word. So you have a staccato sort of um, a pattern of language and this, the, the uh, staccato breaking up of letters and moving them into all the different shapes to form a vortex, this very much connects to uh, Marinetti, uh, who was a spokesperson of uh, the uh, futurist, um, his poetry where he did free word poetry that's very onoma onomatopoeic, that all a burst of sounds. So the shape, oh, oh, whoops, you have, you have the circular shape, then you have the radiating diagonals. It's a propeller. So a circle interacting with uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the diagonals to create this feeling of complete movement and turbulence. And with all the, um, the, the words that are included, a propeller, aviator, described it as sort of instructions emanating from an aeroplane uh, propeller. And the vortex shape, the idea for the futurist was to place the viewer in the center of the work, to involve a viewer physically right in the work. And in this case, the feeling that the machine is the center, the machine is core of modernism, and you, you thrust yourself into that. It's almost like sort of diving into something. And there's the layering of the different parts of the collage as well, add to that. And then the interjection of bits of bits of color. Cara wrote a very um, uh, interesting <laughs> piece on uh, trying to paint noises and sound, yes, yeah, sounds and smells. And that uh, if the, the futurists very much felt artists should move beyond uh, all the normal ways of producing art. And he wanted colors and shapes to evoke smells. But this all connects to ideas that Kandinsky and others were exploring to do with synesthesia, the inter, interrelationship of all the senses, one sense calling upon another. So in all these cases, the artists are trying to break down the singularity of just a visual form and get as many sensations into a work as are possible. Boccioni did it in a, a sort of semi-cubist, uh, figurative style here. Uh, in this work, The Street Enters the House, we are in the body of the woman leaning into the street. The street is leaning into her, she's leaning into the street. Uh, the scaffolding is piercing her head. And this weird thing where a horse is jumping out of her back. And Boccione explained that, that if you're on a train and you're moving fast and you look at the person opposite you, whilst you're looking at the landscape, you have that transference of a bit of a tree or a bit of a landscape on the cheek of a woman, the cheek of a person as they're going past. So he passionately wanted to separate inside and outside and integrate them um, in a whirlwind of modernity, showing its crowds, its cards, telegraph poles, its noise, interpenetration of objects, with the window being a perfect um, air arena in which to explore this because of the outside and the inside. 
and the crashing of the different things taking place, destroying that notion of um, bourgeois safety uh, connected to the domestic, breaking down all the boundaries and trying to get noise to come off it. And then coming forward to um, Rab Robert Rauschenberg's collages that uh, we saw last week, in his collages, again, his thing is massing together lots of uh, disparate images. In this case, they do relate in that he was commissioned by Time magazine to do, uh, to do a cover to celebrate 1970. Well, as you can imagine, uh, they, they rejected the cover because the prominence of the, you know, Vietnam, Vietnam soldiers, student anti-war protests, um, Buzz Aldrin on the moon, uh, Janis Joplin, J.F. Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King, all crammed in without a, um, uh, and you're not forced to read a particular meaning. The whole thing is uh, cramming it all in. And he said he acted in the gap between art and life. He didn't believe in any separation. And he said about this, it's to remind us of love, terror, violence in the last 10 years. Danger lies in forgetting. And finally, I'll just show you um, two. Uh, th this work uh, is uh, a painting or um, that responds to everything that collage uh, made possible and introduced. So this, uh, uh, painting of Spain. I don't know if you can see, but it's it's made up of broken cups and broken plates. And uh, Julian Schnabel uh, went to he went to Barcelona and he saw Bacaguel and the mosaics on the winding balconies uh, there. And he um, wanted to uh, break up all these plates and use plates in his art. His art is on a heroic scale, very gestural, very large. I mean, in galleries, they panic because you could cut yourself on the edges of these, these plates. So it's got a jagged surface and his plates then he mixes the paint with them. They almost become like his brushes. And Schnabel is also um, a very renowned filmmaker. Who's, who's won awards and he sees cinema and um, art going together. He made the, the 1996 film on Basque and um, believed that films were a natural extension of his paintings and that in both paintings and films, he explores the past and the present. And finally, uh, uh, I'll, I'm ending at the the near the same date as I started with a collage that seems to have the um, mystery of uh, Max Ernst's uh, plant studies where he really felt that you could, you could um, see into them and uh, they could reveal many fantasies. Um, paint, you know, a sort of abstract expressionist paint. This line cutting across the photograph of Cologne Cathedral is almost like a sort of a, a half cross mark that you would find on a photographic still of, no, I won't use that photograph. And then it's all been wound around a building that is a World Heritage Site and a building that actually has an amazing history to its construction, that it actually was begun in 1248 and went on till 1888. And then just the final um, uh, other edge to it is that in 2007, Gerhard Richter was commissioned to do an enormous new um, stained glass window in the church. I don't know how much of that feeds into what uh, Schnabel was doing. But his way of doing the work, he invented an interesting way. Um, he, um, uh, oh, wait a sec. <laughs> it's um, carbon print on a fiber, um, um, 
Oh, sorry. This is, this, yeah, I'm almost over. Anyway, it's on fabric and then it's put on a board, but the fabric is porous. So the color goes through on both sides. And this is actually a thing that he uses so that sometimes he can then turn the picture over to the other side and decide to work on the other side instead. In other words, following a technique so similar to Max Ernst's one of feedback and reading into images, other images. And that's the last one. Okay, Dido, thanks. That was a real tour de force. <laughs> and um, fascinating, loads of really fascinating stuff. Ch I'll yeah. check it out, right, yes. Yeah, well done. Um, I don't know about uh, others, my Zoom uh, connections, my internet connection collapsed and then I came back. So hopefully oh, everybody yeah. else has been um, unaffected by that. Uh, so this is really a chance to, <coughs> excuse me, yeah. ask Dido any questions or um, uh, kind of offer any comments of your own about the uh, kind of nature of collage. And um, as I said, you could just, if you click on the participants button and go to the, um, put the list on the uh, far right, you'll, you can um, raise your hand there. Um, so I've got some, one person in, uh, uh, yeah, in who's raised their hand, that's great. Dido, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about, um, I mean, I suppose that thing about, you know that because one of the things that was quite interesting you did is is you sort of looked at collage and then you looked at painting that used collage you know almost like imitated collage yes and um and then you also kind of you spanned i mean the the thing that's quite interesting is the way collage spans in a way the whole of the 20th century yes and more and um and yet it's sort of like it's looking at you, to, you sort of feel like it breaks down, you know, it does a lot to break down the idea of what art is. And I suppose that would be seen as its own success and yet artists keep going back to the, you know, the painted form. I don't know if it's sort of like, I mean, it, is art, I mean, is, is it the kind of the way the collage develops as a form? Is it inter interaction with other art forms? Like you also looked at sculpture and, and that kind of thing. I don't know, maybe that's just too obscure a question. It's, it's just trying to th situate collage in the sort of development of art. Well, if, it, if art is historic, do I answer this now? Yeah, why don't you then? Yeah, just if anybody else comes to Art historically, um, uh, the sort of one of the um, modernist arguments that has been presented to do with to do with collage that it's the sort of natural result of um, uh, increasing attention to the surface of the canvas. So, as artists reject um, modelling to suggest an illusion of form, and they move closer to uh, a flat application of colour that rests on the surface of the canvas, that the ultimate conclusion then is you've run out of space on the surface. Your, your pictorial depth is getting shallower and shallower until everything's on the surface. And so the logical thing then is to add on to the surface. And that's how it evolved with Picasso. He was simplifying, was working from views of buildings and landscapes and, and, and people and simplifying uh, buildings into uh, geometric blocks where you saw all the different sides and gradually as these blocks became simplified some shapes really did seem to be sitting on the canvas and the perspective was getting very very shallow and so the collage how Picasso and Braque invented it it was a way it, it did two functions. It added a new layer of space when everything had become so shallow there was nowhere to go. And it added a new layer of content because it is from the outside world and it has its own meaning. And then that meaning can change the meanings within the work. So it's if you want life in your work, then you are literally taking up a piece of life. And it starts, it can be traced back to 
pictures by Manet where suddenly you get a um, Manet's bar at the Folie Bergère, the little gas lights at the top where they're resting on the surface of the canvas. They're just, you know, they're flat. And many people say, well, that's sort of how it begins, that it's, it comes out of a gradual move towards the flatness of the canvas. Okay, okay, that's, yeah, that's interesting. So Daniel, um, can you unmute yourself, Daniel? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Oh, there you are, yes, okay. Okay, well, thanks a lot for that, Dido. That was uh, fantastic, as usual. Uh, I hesitate to ask this question because I might be reading something into the pictures that wasn't there or asking you something about the pictures that is not there. But I know about five of the pictures you showed were associated with Germany, either by German artists or yeah. Hungarian artists during the, the Nazi period or the late Weimar period. Yes. And I just wondered if you could see that, if it was reflected in the picture. So I know you did mention Hitler was in the Blumenfeld uh, yes. picture you showed. But for example, thinking about the Max Ernst, the entire city from 1934, I mean, that was obviously a year after the Nazis came to power. Yes, and that, and that is very much read in those terms, actually. Yes. Oh, okay, okay. But, but it really was, because because if you look at that and you compare it to some other um, uh, pictures of his, it does have a tension and a bleakness and a feeling of something slightly burnt out. And also even in the engraving, the man sitting in the carriage, it's got quite an, it's got an angrier, more pent up feeling than many of his earlier collages. So very definitely those works are um, are interpreted as reflecting what was going on at the time. Right. Okay. And and then it was shortly after that I think that that Max Ernst escaped to the south of France. Is that is that your question answered, Daniel? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? This is your chance to. I mean, I suppose one of the. Um, yeah. So, so would you say that collage is one of the more ex a bit of following up from what Daniel was saying is is collage one of the more explicitly political art forms? Would you say? In terms well, of it, it, yes. I mean, it 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 can be, and it was used very much. Uh, it um, it revolutionised. Um, the creation of posters in Russia and in Germany. So the mixing of bits of photo and um, uh, collage shapes meant, yes, I mean, a whole series of incredibly powerful posters were created. Um, and like engraving, you know, well, all the art forms that are not painting, you have, uh, you have access to more characters. I mean, um, in Paris, in the in the rights of '68, they took great pride in making posters that had been torn and emphasising the torn paper um, as a, a sort of adding to the power of, of their protests. Instead of having a whole load, I mean, partly they saved money, but instead of having some neatly produced leaflets. The, the tearing was very much seen as uh, a method that that had uh, revolutionary potential. Okay, it carries, it carries the thing of an act. You sense the hand acting, so right. it has great presence. Okay, Deirdre. Um, I I was just wanting to comment on that terrifying eye, sphinx-like eye oh, in the yes. past. And you mentioned that he was quite anti-clerical. And do you think that was a, the kind of uh, very distorted and powerful image of the, you know, the eye of God watching Definitely. you? That, that's yes. actually a perverse eye that's yes. a, wire, a wire God. 
yes of looking in on on the man and the woman's legs yeah i think it's uh, sort of adam and eve are there and there's this terrifying yes. God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think it's very very much that it's it's the the church eye and um you know being judged and what you're supposed to conform to and and then it's the um the sort of um mythical eye kind of cyclops and and ants read a lot of freud's case studies so he was very it's the inner eye he was for them that was what they were dealing with was the real the the strongest reality is the interior reality the reality of your subconscious and so the eye becomes a very uh, powerful um, powerful feature to use okay so, great oh, super ego eye as well yes yeah. yes yeah. yes exactly yeah so he he was very interested in all those and he he had you know a lot of his works were to do with the um overbearing mm -hmm. father yeah the, the you know the church the overbearing father mm -hmm. um authority figures okay uh shirley uh, unmute um okay it's just a, I mean, it's just a small comment really um when you're talking about the political um orientation or development within within collage um it seems to me that the once you add the written word in then yeah. you become much more di directive in a sense than by by just by using you know shape and other forms and texture and layer because the word makes a much clearer often or, you know in, in in many cases a political point so it actually yes. it, it really is quite changes quite fundamentally what what the visual that visual form is surely i would have thought yes, it, um, it, it does yes but i just wanted to ask a question as well which is a bit of a silly question um who do you think who would you say is the most interesting or even best exponent of collage. I'd only really come across Picasso before and was always really quite bowled over by, yeah. by him. And you've opened the world up a bit, but you know, what, what do you, who, who's the best? Gosh, that's different. I think I like Picasso the most. Um, I like his collages, but... Um, Oh gosh! <laughs> no, I think I do. I I do like his collages uh, best, but out of photo montages, um, then that would be no, then that would be other people. Yes, I'm not quite sure. I think yeah, I think I think I uh, when the recent exhibition of his work on paper at the Royal Academy. Um, mm well, recent, I mean, ages ago now, but uh, it was really surprising how brilliant lots of the very small things he'd done were. And what I like about his stuff is you, you feel somebody trying to work something out and trying to explore. It goes against the idea of I'm making a grand statement, I'm making a grand bit of art. So I think it's exciting from the point of view of your, your you're right in with the process. Does, does that, I mean, following on for that though, does that mean, um, we're just thinking about the development of collage as an art form. Uh, does that mean it's sort of like, uh, I mean, you know, you're saying maybe not, every, people, not everybody's going to agree with you that Picasso is the best. So, you know, that is the sort of, um, you know, most of us think he is, but, it's a sort of like, does that mean that the collage form has not really developed? It's kind of gone around in a series of circles. Because if you think about, I don't know this, whether this really is a legitimate point, but you know, if you think about painting, you know, mm -hmm. painting continued to develop as a technique and experimenting with a material and thing like that, something like that. And you know, you then get up to the point where Picasso, you know, uses it and then kind of uh, breaks its use, the, breaks the rules around its use, so uses it in a much less representational way. Whereas, um, 
you know, you look at the history that you've, you know, you've you've drawn uh, a history of collage that you know ends in twenty. Well, you know, not doesn't end, but you know, your last image or or your most recent image rather is twenty eighteen, and at the you know twenty. So so collage continues to be a very active art form. Yes, yes. I mean, especially photo montage. The thing is, it it is back to the two original. It's it's now incorporates its original purpose in Victorian time where you know anybody could could have great fun putting all these different photographs together and on the web now all the different um, I don't know TikTok or whatever you call it these ones where you know you put your photo in and all these funny animals land on your head and you're moving around and uh, it's very very popular now you know it's 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 very popular with the general public those things but and it's reflected in art and collage in terms of it being separate from painting still its influence is present in many paintings as every time there's an aspect of appropriation in a painting in many ways it's being used in that in that collage way it's just that it happens that they've painted all the bits together instead of sticking them on but the the principle behind it is is adding and borrowing and creating new juxtapositions that don't um, uh, yes that break up a single story. Yeah. Um. Okay. I've got somebody else. Katerina, do you like to um? Yeah. Oops. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um. Dido, I was just interested in um how um collages were perceived at the time. Uh, particular when sort of the first collages were made by Picasso and um, also by the surrealists. And I was just wondering how the art establishment and also the general public reacted to that. Um, because I think, so I went to art college in the 90s and I was a particular fan of collages and I always thought it was sort of a bit um, seen as not proper art. Uh, at least that was always the impression I, I got sort of, you know, sort of from AMA art tutors and generally from friends and family. So just interesting to see how, how it progressed and how it was seen, you know, by art critics and the public at the time. Well, I think it probably was put slight initially. Um, I mean, the avant-garde was sort of welcoming, but I think it would probably have been was seen more in terms of being relating to studies and drawings and being a stepping stone to something else initially. And then Picasso's collages were accepted as works on their own, but even the early ones that were produced were actually seen as kind of, um, you know, working out problems to help you solve a problem in a painting. So as studies. So I think, yes, the, the art world initially they were seen as studies, but then the surrealist collages, I mean, the point is everything that the surrealists were doing um, would have offended the public. So the collages as well. And also many of the collages, they're much more hard hitting than the paintings. So there are a whole load that are very, very obscenely erotic and um, more violent. So it's as if more stuff can be said with, within them. And when they're small, then they're, it, um, then they're quite close to the idea of an illustration in the book as well. So I don't specifically know what critics said about collages that when it suddenly um, got popular, but Picasso, uh, his little sculptural collages, you know, they were, they became very, very important artworks in terms of showing his development and his experimentation. And then by introducing it, you know, leading on from that, it's more in sculpture that you get these enormous steps forward because it's the introduction of other materials into large sculptures that really wouldn't have happened or it was very influenced by um, opening art up to rubbish and 
ephemera, um, things that you throw away, then that was embraced by sculpture and could be done on a large scale. So in many ways, you see its influence most powerfully in sculpture, I think. Interesting. So um, I've got a, a statement here, but I think it's a sort of question which says collage is a conversation. Um, is that something, I mean, is that true? Dido, do you think? Um, is, is it well, more conversational than a painting? Yes, it's, it's, or sculpture. some of them it is very much because it's one thing balanced against another or one thing bound for a position against another. So it's a bit like an argument, yes. And, okay. and the way it's used, when they talk about the dialectic of a collage, yes, it's, you know, an argument presented or a balancing between two bits where you don't know which one takes precedence. You don't, um, you, you don't get such a stark uh, contrast and vine for space in, in, paintings it's more yeah I think a collage yeah I think that's quite a good way of putting it it is a sort of conversation yeah some of them but not all of them you know they're, they're, they're as varied as paintings are hmm. I suppose uh, I mean a lot of the collages you presented today particularly but also probably last week were about questioning something you know at, yes. at the very least about how you look at something if not about how, how you think about something yes well, it could be sort of a visual, a visual poem in a way. Mm. Yeah. Um, and then um, I've got another question from somebody on the chat and then I'll, um, there seem to be no other hands raised. So unless another hand, ra uh, hand goes up in the last, um, in the next couple of minutes, then um, this will be your last question. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, do um, I want red or white wine? Not sure. <laughs> so, um, so the basic is a question about books showing contemporary subversive collage, yeah. uh, not necessarily by professional artists, but I um, mean its use in street protests. So, are there other books about that that you know of? I know I've seen. There's a lot online, isn't there? I mean, I have seen a lot online. Yeah, there are lots. I'm really sorry. I'm a bit. Um, I'm not. Um, I'm not up to date enough with that. I know there are lots. I mean, there's tons and tons of information out there on it, yeah. but I can't recommend one. I'm not, I'm not, I, I will investigate. Yeah, it, it does seem like, I suppose another question, I've got another question here as well, but my, so my, um, don't answer this straight away. I'll just ask it and then I'll invite John to speak. But one of the things about it, I suppose, is um, just following on from that question about, you know, street protests is the idea of collage being a particularly democratic form of art. I mean, if you look online, there are, you know, it just seems like an incredibly popular art form that anybody can do. Yeah. And um, so that seems to be one of its main characteristics. OK, so John is going to speak, ask a question now. John Rowland. OK, thank you. Hi, hi Dino. Um, a slightly technical question, but uh, given um, advances in digital photography, and obviously you have the example of the photo montage, um, could this be the death of the sort of traditional get out a pair of scissors and you know c cutting out shapes from photographs and magazines as we see uh, a, a greater and greater um, use of um, the likes of Photoshop, etc. And ultimately, I guess, where do you draw the line between uh, something being purported to be a photo montage and s something simply being um, uh, photoshopped to uh, enhance a, a photo uh, you know, insertion of uh, uh, whatever, in insertion of a sun in the sky of a photograph um, uh, uh, you, you using uh, digital techniques? Is there a sort of definition in terms of where that line might be drawn? Hmm. Um, I think if I was to draw the line, I would say um, the photo montage can still remain as long as the difference would be one person is um, altering a photo that's existing 
but the other one is still involved in the selection, the cutting, the moving. There's still a great deal of selection involved. Mm. So in a way, the Photoshop stuff is you, you, you're still doing the selection first. So as long as you're doing that, yes, you have, um, you have the ease that the Photoshop will do some of those other things more quickly, but you are still taking the photographs yourself. You're still doing that selection and the cropping and the cutting and the fitting together. So yeah, yeah. It, it still is in that way, uh, quite interactive, but the person who's very good on that is David Hockney because he's engaged with every new technology as it comes along. And um, he works with them all. And then afterwards says things like, actually, this is really boring. I think I'll do a drawing. And so <laughs> one thing that he comments about with lots of digital stuff is it's a surface thing of an incredibly boring surface that is the first thing you confront is the uniformity of the surface, which is very different from having a, a uniformity where the image hangs together. So somebody um, like um, Emily Ashchurch, the first thing I showed you, I mean, you know, she spends the research that goes into yeah, it. Yeah. It's, it's months and months and months and months of work. And she obviously takes good photographs. So it's, if you take a lousy photograph and you do Photoshop, it's still going to be a lousy photograph that's Photoshopped. It's not going to, Photoshop isn't going to make it, isn't going to make it yeah, good. Yeah. But the bad thing about it is this, this sliding sort of veneer, which cuts out things, which is the same as, I mean, for instance, this PowerPoint presentation, if I was doing a slide presentation, which now in most institutions you're not allowed to do the slide presentations the image was so much more powerful and you didn't have this bland screen that just evens everything out to be one thing well despite that um dido it was a really fascinating talk and really you brought as usual brought lots and lots to it so i'm just trying to unmute ev mute everybody so we can uh, yes. Give you a round of applause. Thanks. Yeah. Well, Peter, even though I haven't seen you all. <laughs> well done, Lido. Yeah. Well, thank you all for coming. Oh, I wish I could see you.